Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 280 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Uh, today's lecture will be covering uh, the topic of serious games, and by that they mean uh, games that are intended for purposes other than just entertainment. Uh, so there's quite a bit of interest in this topic, uh, again, from game studies, but also from the business world, uh, education. Uh, there's a lot of other industries besides the commercial games industry that are interested in taking some of uh, what we know about games, what makes them fun, what makes them, you know, what are, what is uh, their potential beyond just uh, keeping people entertained. Uh, so it's a big topic. There's a lot of uh, pieces to it, but we'll see what we can do with it here today. Uh, so here's the objectives. We'll talk about the history of games designed for purposes other than entertainment. <laughs> in other words, the serious games. Where does this movement come from? How long has it been around? Actually, it's been around since before there were video games, uh, so that'll be fun. Uh, we talk about some of the rationale, some of the theories behind this concept of, uh, that's a horrible term, but <laughs> edutainment. <laughs> it's painful. <laughs> uh, anyway, what's the uh, strategies behind that? Uh, we'll talk about some traditional modern approaches to the dread dreaded educational game. Uh, we'll talk about some uh, political games, uh, so basically games for propaganda purposes, uh, some news games, that's, that's an interesting movement. Uh, and then here's another one of these great terms, advertainment. <laughs> Sounds like a medical condition. I've, I've come down with a terrible case, doctor, of advertainment. Uh, uh, yes, put him on ad advertainment immediately. Okay, I'm already having a little too much fun with this topic. Oh, boy, but then we get into gamification. Uh, you know, I'm so, I didn't come up with, <laughs> with these terms. <laughs> wow, gamification. Yeah, but that is a thing. Uh, we'll get into that as well. And then finally, uh, games for change. You know, and by that, they don't mean games for pocket change, although that's <laughs> sometimes, sometimes the motive. Uh, now we'll be talking about games... Uh, for lack of a better word, social justice games. Uh, all right, here's the first question for you then. Uh, so I want you to think back, maybe in a classroom, maybe just something your parents got for you, maybe a device, a toy of some sort, uh, but some kind of educational game. Uh, or uh, maybe it was a commercial game that you feel like taught you something. A lot of people say they play civilization and learned about geography or some history from that. Uh, just something like that. Uh, compare that experience to what you might learn in a classroom setting, traditional schoolroom, and then what do you think was more effective, the game or the classroom? Uh, so just ponder this topic, you know, let's just try to stay somewhere in the ballpark of this topic for about a hundred words. Uh, cogitate on that a little bit and then come back and we'll continue. All right, so the value of it all. Uh, so what a lot of people that get into this topic of serious games, I think there's kind of a an insecurity, if you will, that people don't like the idea of doing something just for entertainment, right? They, a game developer, game designer, uh, they don't want to, some of them are fine with this, you know, the ones that are making money, but you know, I think it kind of bothers other ones. Like, you know, I feel like my life serves no purpose. I'm just here. I'm entertaining. I'm amusing, uh, keeping uh, small children happy or whatever. Uh, but I don't feel like I'm really contributing to society or culture in any kind of meaningful way. I see, I almost feel guilty about this. Uh, so that's part of this. But uh, the serious games movement kind of comes in and says, well, you could be doing other things, right? We could make games that would inspire change, for example, social change, or teach people things. Uh, so that's kind of what's driving some of this. So what do players take away from video games? Uh, how do they influence individuals? Uh, so this is a topic that's been around for a long time. A lot of people just point out the negatives. Uh, you know, it takes a lot of time, it's addictive, whatever. Uh, but maybe you could say playing games does something positive, right? Maybe it makes you think faster. Uh, maybe it improves your hand-eye coordination. You know, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so that's part of it. Maybe there is something positive here that's just being ignored. Uh, second, can players learn anything from games other than how to play them? Uh, so this is a big topic. It's been around for a while, as we said, with Civ or SimCity. Uh, there's one SimEarth, uh, Minecraft, 
the one a game that comes to my mind. There's a lot of other games where I feel like, uh, yeah, you can learn how to play the game. Certainly, that's part of it. But you also learn other things. Uh, I always think about uh, Dungeons Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, and you watch people play that game and you feel like, well, it's more than just the game. I mean, they're kind of learning how to work as a team. They're kind of learning. Uh, there was a study just done recently about how uh, really shy kids, you know, kids that have a really hard time, I guess you'd call them like really introverted kids. Uh, they sort of open up when they're playing D&D and role-playing games. And they're kind of basically talking. <laughs> and they're learning how to talk and be a conversant. So I'd say that's a pretty valuable thing for these kids to be learning. Uh, in addition to like the D and D rules, you know, it's it's more about that social communication angle. Uh, third, can players be manipulated by simple rewards and status, perhaps to motivate them to learn or work? And so that's another factor. You know, as I mentioned, we'll get into this, but some of these businesses and industries they're trying to find ways to make uh, doing a job more like a game. And the purpose of that is to make it more productive, make the worker more productive, right? You put up, <laughs> you, you put up a leaderboard, you put up some points and whatever. And maybe this is kind of like brainwashing, basically, or conditioning people, uh, to basically depriving them of free will somehow. So there's a little bit of concern about that. Right, so this is something that's always bothered me. Uh, I call it the cake is a lie from, it's a reference to, uh, uh, the Portal series. Uh, but anyway, this is what I've noticed. I've probably talked to hundreds of game designers at this point. Publishers, you know, you name it. People at all walks of the industry. And there seems to be, uh, what I would say, they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. All right. So on the one hand, they say, uh, you know, if you bring up violence and you say, do video games cause kids to be more violent? Uh, is it causing uh, people to be more... Uh, less social, anti-social or things of that sort. And they always say no. You know, I've yet to find one uh, who would say yes to that. They always say that the game, this is just a game, it's just entertainment. You know, yes, there are people that might already have these pre-existing mental conditions. You know, maybe they would be more violent. Uh, but they always just say it's just a game, right? There's just nothing more here than a game. <laughs> <laughs> That's they don't want to uh, basically they don't want to shoulder any of the burden, assume any of the risk whatsoever for anything negative uh, about people playing games. But you know, within the same breath, if you talk about positive change, then suddenly they're like, yes, oh, by the way, yes, games do have a strong impact. Uh, they're changing society, they're changing culture for the better. Uh, okay, you know, I think you see the problem there. Uh, so, yeah, they contradict themselves. They suggest games can cause or at least influence positive changes. Uh, again, the heightened productivity we've talked about, the, the hand-eye coordination, teamwork skills. Uh, James Paul G. writes extensively about this. We'll also talk about him. Uh, cognitive development. You know, this whole games for change movement is basically that's the whole idea is we can make uh, people play these games and it'll change their mindsets. It'll change their attitudes. Uh, it can teach people things. So it seems like you can't say on the one hand that, you know, if that's true, basically, if games can do that, then you have to show, you have to take this other bit, right? You can't say the games don't can't possibly teach people to be more violent. That's impossible, but it is possible to teach them to be more peaceful. You know, I think you see what I'm getting at there. Uh, so it's something that doesn't really get talked about too much, but I see a real disconnect there. I don't like that on the one hand you can't have the negative, but... You know, it seemed like you either had to say they can't do anything, positive or negative, or you have to say, yes, they can do both. Uh, here's the, some of the terminology, and I just always cr I cringe at <laughs> these terms. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, they're what we have to work with. A lot of this is from marketing. You know, that's a, you know get a game designer talking about the marketing team. <laughs> you know, a lot of times they'll have a good title for a game, and they'll come in and make them change the title. Uh, things of that sort of make them add weird stuff to the game just because it's popular. Uh, so a lot of times the, the developers don't like the marketing people too much. On the other hand, you know, they wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for those marketing people. So, you yeah, know, take that with a grain of salt. Uh, anyway, edutainment, it's basically taking that word education and entertainment and sort of cramming it together in an unholy hot dog. Uh, games with a pronounced educational ambition. So if you go to Walmart, 
I think there's still some games at Walmart. <laughs> you probably wouldn't find any of these at GameStop. I, maybe you would. Uh, but usually there's a rack or an aisle somewhere where it's like spelling and math blaster, you know, that sort of thing. It's usually geared for smaller kids. Uh, and that's, you know, the idea is this will teach you to do your algebra better or something. Uh, edutainment, as you can tell, it probably appeals more to parents uh, than it does to the, the kids themselves. But, you know, there's, there's been a few hits uh, here and there. Uh, so that's edutainment. We'll talk more about it. Uh, then we've got advertainment, and you can see what they did there. They took advertising and entertainment again, and, you know, there we go. Uh, adver game, same sort of deal, just advertising plus something else. Uh, some of these turn out better than others. Uh, I remember one called Spot, Cool Spot. Uh, the 7-Up still have their little Cool Spot character? I don't even know. Uh, that actually was a fun game. People paid paid money for that one. Uh, but usually these are pretty uh, pretty horrible. Uh, Burger King did some. Uh, health games. So this is where I think there's a lot of potential. This has really taken off. Probably more than any, any of this other stuff. The, 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 the Fitbits, uh, the, uh, the iWatch. You know, in addition to getting like tracking steps and beats and things, you can actually play games around that concept. Uh, there's a lot of Azuma games with the Kinect. And things and I, I you know I see a lot of money there because people love the idea people are really into physical fitness and if you also like video games it's like wow this is two of my favorite things coming together you know it's it's, it's great that's so that's where I see a lot of potential uh, the games for change again this is the social justice type games so it's probably easier just to show you some of those but you know that's the idea there is you think, well, how can we teach moral, good moral values, make people more ecologically minded, environmental, you know, whatever your social cause is. Uh, you think, well, how can I use video games to try to convert people to my uh, ideology? Uh, then these authors talk a little bit about the traditional games. So I thought this was interesting. Uh, most of us who do video game studies, we probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about what was there before. You know, the, the authors of this book totally forgot about pinball. I mean, this is one example. Uh, but they do point out there were all these, I guess, stu uh, teachers in working with uh, card games or board games. You know, I remember a lot of my teachers back <laughs> in high school would play like a Jeopardy-style game. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be an electronic game. Uh, and it come to find out that this teachers and, uh, I guess, uh, education professors education scholars have been studying this idea can we teach kids with games and what's some good ways to do that what are the best practices for this and it goes way back apparently uh seemed like a, even maybe a hundred years or more of studies on this uh, so all of that basically amounts to this they find that games are about as effective as other methods so not necessarily better not necessarily worse there's some evidence that it sticks in your brain a lot longer uh, so, you you know, you memorize a bunch of stuff for a test. Uh, in the short term, you might look better off for doing that instead of just playing a game. But they say, you know, you come back in a few years and talk to those same students, and the ones that played the games will remember, uh, whereas the ones that just kind of crammed for that test, they've forgotten everything. You know, they, they, they learn what they needed for the quiz, and then they forgot it all. Uh, students prefer games to traditional methods and feel... <laughs> <laughs> they have learned more. <laughs> so, you know, you could say, I've seen this with TV studies too. You you show students something like CSI and they, you know, they feel like they know a lot more science or uh, crime scene investigation than the ones who haven't seen the show. Only problem is they've learned bunk. You know, the show is, you know, the show is full of crap, just made up stuff. And so even though you feel like you know more, you don't actually know more. Uh, but it is kind of important sometimes, you know, you don't want to, f you know, if you feel like you have a certain confidence, uh, that might predispose. You might make it easier for you to learn new things, learn the right things, uh, than if you feel like you, if you have low confidence or you feel like, well, this is way beyond me, you know, I'll, I'll never be able to learn this. Uh, so this, I, I, you know, the, the concept of a double-edged sword keeps coming back uh, with these points. Let's see, debriefing is important. Uh, so this is, a, I think, one of the key insights here is you can't just have the kids playing the game, like, just you know, just sit junior or whatever in front of a game for a while and, uh, you know, he'll do better at his homework. 
Uh, you really want to be there as a parent or as a teacher. It's sort of, uh, there's a debriefing, you know, so the kid plays a while, then you talk about the experience, right? Say, well, that sound, you know, you sort of, what did you learn from that? Uh, talk it over. And they say, that sort of thing makes a really big difference. So if you take the time, and you know, the same thing with those TV studies, right? Uh, if, if you watch an educational film and then talk it over, uh, you, turn to, you tend to learn a lot more that way than if you just watch it and move on. Uh, and then finally, oh, here's a shocker. <laughs> Schools aren't the best environment for gaming. <laughs> wow, yeah. We needed a lot of government money to find that out. All right, categorizing educational games. Uh, so they've uh, split these into categories here, which I think are pretty good categories. I like this. So they talk about the first category that I always I thought about this. These were the ones I thought about first. Edutainment that teaches certain specific skills. So your Pajama Sams, uh, Castle of Dr. Brains, uh, Math and Spelling are popular. Um, you know, these they make a lot of claims. The people that market these games are like, oh, yeah, your kid's going to learn a lot from playing this. I remember there was a bunch of memory games recently on the iPhone that was along these same lines, and the idea was... Um, I, mean, I remember at one point they were even saying if you're losing your memory for getting older, uh, playing these games will keep your memory alive. <laughs> Just like they're making these claims, but there's no real science to back any of that up. You know, one of these that they didn't mention here, uh, but I thought was great, actually, was called uh, Typing of the Dead. It was this uh, zombie game. So the zo I think it was on the Dreamcast. Uh, but the zombies were coming at you, and you had to, like, type things quickly. And if you could type quick enough, you would kill the zombies. Otherwise, the zombies would get to you. And a lot of people just love that. And it, that's I know people personally who, uh, you know, they worked on their typing skills, or data entry, whatever you want to call it, just because that game was well designed. And so that was, you know, that, that worked well, even though it was, they didn't really market it as a typing game per se, uh, but it worked. And then let's see, that's, so that's the one category, a game specifically made for that. Uh, the other category is just you take a game that exists, it's a popular game, and then you try to find educational values for it, ways to bring it into a classroom. Uh, Minecraft and Kerbal Space Program are probably the two that came to your mind. These are the ones I've heard the most about. Uh, there are a few other examples, but we'll get into those. And then this uh, last category is the ones where Instead of this commercial developer kind of cynically trying to find a way to market their game and, you know, spelling or whatever, with no theory behind it, uh, these folks are coming basically out of, com they're coming out of game studies or education. Uh, they're basically scholars, uh, people who've studied this stuff, uh, psychologists, educational specialists, and they find ways <clears throat> to make games that, you know, according to their understanding of the human mind, the way learning works, uh, they make games based on that. So these are kind of the cream of the crop in terms of uh, theoretical soundness and actual study to back to back them up. Uh, but since it is coming from uh, educators, you know, it's probably not the flashiest. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like you, you watch any kind of educational TV and it always looks very cheaply made. You know, same thing with games. It's, it's really rare to find uh, uh, a really slick you know, triple-A style uh, education game. You're probably just not going to find it because there's, frankly, just not enough money in it. Uh, so here's one of the best ones of those research-based ones. This is one I, I really enjoyed this game. It's called Physicus. It's a little bit dated now, but this was designed by physics instructor. I think a physics professor, a physics teacher made the game, and I don't know he had a... I don't even know if it's a he or she. I'm pretty sure it's a he... Uh, that worked on this, but they were trying to find ways to like embody the learning in a fantasy context in a game that would actually be fun. So it looks like it's pulled up there. Let me see if I can get this a little bigger here. And they'll see. Yeah, so this is teaching you physics. You can see acoustics, science of heat. Let's see what happens here. Optics. In order for us to be able to see anything at all, light has to reach our eyes. If we keep our eyes closed, or if we are in a completely dark room, 
we do not see anything. In other words, all right, so I'm not going to spend a lot, a lot of time on this, but the idea is you learn these physics principles, and then there are all these puzzles in the game where you, you use the physics uh, to open up a door or you know whatever the puzzle might be. And so there's one about simple machines. Uh, so this is kind of interesting because it's not just total fantasy, right? They bring in real-life physics, and you can see the formulas there. And the game itself is, you know, it's okay. It's kind of like Mist. We talked about that a while back. And so it does have some fairly good production values. Uh, but it's a pretty good example of, you know, you're trying to break the educational bit, be the game, uh, instead of just, you know, an afterthought. Right? You have to learn the physics to be able to move forward in the game. The, and it's about that. Uh, so... Uh, that's the goal of these research-based games is to really try to embody the learning goal in the game. Uh, so that's the uh, physics. Here's one that's more popular than that. It's called the Oregon Trail. It's where that idea of dysentery. You see people with the t-shirts on that say, I've died of dysentery. <laughs> that's, where, that's where this comes from. It's, it's certainly a cult classic game. Uh, we played the hell out of it back in the uh, 80s and early 90s uh, with this. I think it's still around. There's a board game based on it that's a lot of fun, too. Uh, but anyway, here's a link to archive.org. They've got it set up in a browser, so you can just play it. they got a 1990 version here. You know, and by the way, they don't mention this in the book, but this was designed here in Minnesota. So a lot of people don't know that. But again, it's one of these weird Minnesotan originals, uh, the Oregon Trail. You know, come out of like this Minnesota teacher's video game research group. Uh, and they made basically the most famous educational game of all time. Uh, pretty awesome. Uh, anyway, so I think it's worth about 15 minutes at least. So play that for a while. Uh, you know, don't think too hard about it as you're playing it. Just have fun. Uh, but then when you come back, try to write about what you learned about the Oregon Trail from that. Do you feel like they met their goals? I mean, the purpose of this, obviously, teaching students probably uh, history, maybe geography, I don't know, uh, about the history of this Oregon Trail. Uh, so have some fun, come back, and we'll continue. All right, so how does any of this work scientifically speaking? Is there any evidence to back up or refute for that matter that these games are actually teaching you anything? How can we measure it? Uh, what kind of assumptions are they making? Uh, and if you're in education, you probably know all about this. Or psychology, a lot of uh, different fields use these uh, theories. Uh, it's not really my area. I'm more of a, a rhetorician, as you know, <laughs> than a scientist. But... Uh, nevertheless, I think we can all wrap our heads around these concepts. Uh, the first is what's called behaviorism. And this is uh, based on the idea of conditioning our responses to environmental stimuli shape our actions. So if I remember correctly, this was a, a psychologist by the name of B.F. Skinner was the one who really took off with this. The book mentioned somebody else. But uh, there's also a scientist named Pavlov. And he was doing this thing with dogs where you would ring a bell and then feed the dogs every day. Ring a bell, feed the dogs. Ring a bell, feed the dogs. And then it eventually got to the point where they could just ring the bell and these dogs would automatically start salivating uh, just because they had been conditioned by that association of the bell and then the, you know, the food. Uh, so the, the idea here is we can't really get into anybody's brain. We can't really see what's going on mentally. So let's just forget about that, bracket it off. That's not what we're studying here. Uh, instead, just look at what we can see with our own eyes. You know, you could measure that saliva. Uh, you know, you could see behavior. You can you could study this basically. You can observe it, uh, whereas you can't really do too much. You know, with the with the head, and so you can't really get inside here to see what's going on. Uh, so that's sort of the the basis of this, and you can see where. Yeah, you know, here's the dog. So if you look on the left side of this uh, diagram, you see the little dog there. The the treats, you know, kind of associate that. Rewards and punishments, so you get into like positive reinforcements and negative reinforcements and so on. Uh, and then aversion therapy. Not sure what that, I guess that's uh, to try to scare you. What is he, smoking? <laughs> uh, so I guess trying to get you not to smoke by uh, making you averse to that. Is that like a clockwork orange? If you've ever seen that movie. 
Let's see, behaviorism for games. Uh, right, so the way, when they make games based on this theory, uh, the idea is you do some work, you know, you learn something, and then you get a reward. So the, the classic case was one Ian Bogos talk, talks about is you play a little racing game. And here's one with the spelling. So let me turn the sound on here. It was like, Good job. It, each of them was like on, um, it was, it, the thing it had actually oh. had like a, job. it was basically math and stuff like that. Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. So it tells them spell Fahrenheit. So then you type in the word and I guess you get congratulations and then you get to move on and play some more of this uh, platform game basically. So it's kind of one of these run and jumping kind of games, but just every now and then it stops and you have to answer a spelling question. And if you uh, don't get the spelling question right, I guess you can't play anymore. Uh, so that's the idea. And the same, there's a lot of racing games based on this idea. You, you know, you're racing around a track and then you'll have to answer a math problem. Uh, if you get it right, you get to play some more of the game. If you get it wrong, I guess you have to keep trying. Uh, so the problem with that is, <laughs> well, a lot of problems. <laughs> Uh, one is they call a what they talk about a low intrinsic motivation. Why such a fancy way to put it? They, they basically just it's not any fun, or right, the game is no fun, uh, or the fun is just in the reward, not in the activity itself. So the math is still just as boring as ever. Uh, you're not even trying to make it more fun. You're just saying that if you suffer through this math or you suffer through the spelling bit, uh, then you can play the fun part. So it's not making the activity itself fun. It's just saying, if, you know, if we do this, if we do this, then we'll have some fun later is the idea. So the intrinsic just means it's not inside. It's not inside the activity. It's outside. You know, do your homework, and then we'll go outside and play. Uh, number two, no integrated learning experience. Learning component is distinctive from the gameplay. So we saw that. Uh, it's based on drill and practice learning or rote memorization. All right, so you're not really learning too much in that game that I just showed you about, like how to spell. Uh, you're just basically memorizing certain spellings, right? You, you play it enough times, I guess you would know how to spell Fahrenheit, uh, but that's just rote memorization. Uh, same thing with those math problems or algebra, or whatever. The gameplay, very simplistic, yes. And then lastly, no teacher presence. So the idea with all those games, <clears throat> they don't talk enough about you needing to be there with the kid or the teacher needing to be there with the student to talk it over, report, do a debriefing. Okay, so that's behaviorism. Uh, the cognitive psychology, they do start trying to say, well, let's see what we can do about mental stuff. So let's not just ignore everything that's going on inside the head. Uh, let's see, maybe there's some way we can measure it, study it, uh, there's different ways to go about that. You know, of course, nowadays we have all this machinery and instruments and various kinds of ways to scan the brain. Uh, there's still a lot of room to do. Uh, but you can start to start getting at, like, how does memory work? Uh, how do people make decisions? So we have a little bit more understanding of that, at least from the point of view of these cognitive psychologists. And again, not really my area. I'm not a psychologist. If you do take psychology classes, you probably know all about this, probably know more than I do about it. Uh, but anyway, that's the basic idea, right? It's, it's, let's look at the what we can know, what we can learn from looking at the way people actually think and remember and learn. Uh, so Thomas Ballone being a figure here, uh, the gameplay and edu educational content have to be integrated. So doesn't like that idea of just using it as a reward. You need to make the game itself part of the learning. Uh, the fantasy increases intrinsic motivation. All right, so that's one thing that the that spelling game did get right. You know, kind of had kind of a space uh, science fiction world. You know, and the physicists kind of had this fantasy-like land. Uh, this is the mistake here. The fantasy. Let me just quick diversion here. But uh, I remember there was a movement here in Minnesota with the game Second Life if you can even call that a game. It was kind of like this big online uh, social thing, really. Uh, you made a character, and then you could wonder. You could, like, dance with people and talk to people. It's very, uh, like, a, basically like a glorified chat space. Uh, but anyway, the uh, Minsku, or the, the Minnesota State University system, 
uh, they had the brilliant idea of let's buy uh, an island in Second Life. And this was, it cost a lot of real money. It's like hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't know, some, some crazy sum uh, for Minsky to buy this island. And they're going to, they're going to teach with this. It's going to be the, you know, the next big breakthrough. My God, you know, this is going to be huge. Uh, you know, it's going to put Minnesota on the map, you know. <laughs> uh, the students, everybody's going to be going to Second Life to learn. Uh, you're not going to go to college classes. You're going to go to Second Life. Anyway, so they totally didn't read anything from Malone, obviously, because they completely uh, missed this bit about the fantasy. Uh, so the, if you look at Second Life, a lot of these worlds, even back, I don't know if it's still around now, actually, but you know, a lot of these were pretty fantastic places that people had developed. They had these sort of elaborate disco halls. Uh, some of them look like ancient history, the columns. You know, a lot of them were uh, based on other things like Star Wars or... Uh, you know, popular movies, you know, very beautiful, elaborate settings. Uh, so it's a lot of fantasy involved. And the Minsky, though, they said, let's just copy the buildings on the uh, university campus. So they, so they had basically the same old boring uh, college buildings. I mean, the desk. I mean, it was like the, the most unimaginative, unimaginative thing you could imagine, <laughs> think of. <laughs> Just, you know, like, like, like who wanted, isn't the whole point, you know, to not be in a classroom and go somewhere fantastic? Uh, so anyway, I think that's why it, it ultimately failed. There's just no creativity. But, you know, unfortunately, I see this all too often. You know, anytime there's talk on a campus about let's do this educational uh, virtual world, they're like trying to, always trying to copy a classroom in a schoolhouse. Like, you know, you could have kids on the back of a dragon flying through the clouds. <laughs> Use your imagination. Be a little bit creative. <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> uh, okay, anyway, moving on. Uh, control is another factor. So you want to feel like you're controlling the game. You don't want to feel like it's controlling you, basically. You're like the teacher that's sort of forcing you to, to move on or move at their pace. Uh, you want to have a little more control. Kind of goes with this curiosity angle. You know, these open world games are popular because you don't feel like you have to do exactly one thing. You know, you can go over here for a while, do this. You can go do that for a while. Just, you know, whatever you're feeling like doing. Uh, and that's powerful. Let's see, challenge. You know, just difficult enough. So you don't want the game to be so easy. You're just clicking through it. Just, it begins to feel like tedium. Uh, on the other hand, it can be too hard, and that just gets uh, frustrating after a while. Uh, so these are things. Most popular games you can think of, all these factors factors will be there, right? Super Mario uh, World or Brothers, whatever, any of those games. You know, you got a great setting. It's very fantastical. You know, good controls. A lot of them, there's even, like, secret levels you can find. There's certainly You can certainly lose these games and... Now, there's usually something there. You always want to go back and do the level a couple of times and see if you could find, like, maybe there's a little part that I didn't see, like some hidden content, uh, a secret area. You know, so you get curious about it, right? Uh, so all the good games do these things, but sadly, the educational games, they tend to be too rigid. You know, they can't get out of this uh, sort of uh, schoolhouse mindset. Uh, then lastly, we have the constructivism. So I guess this is the most recent one as far as these authors are concerned. So they're saying, you know, these are the new kids on the block, right? So they're saying, oh, we're move, we're far beyond the cognitive psychologist. My God, that's ancient. <laughs> you know? It's this thing every time there's a, you know, every generation or so, there has to be this new theoretical movement so the new professors can get tenure and uh, promotions you can't get tenure and promotions just by going along with the status quo right you have to say look we this is the revolution <laughs> we have moved on right uh, all that other stuff is it's kind of like selling a new version of windows right you, you have to say this new version of windows makes that old version of windows look pathetic uh same 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 deal but anyway what what is the constructivist all about uh so they're about people constructing their own understanding and knowledge of the world through experiencing things and reflecting on them. So the I guess the catchphrase with this is students need to learn how to learn. So it's not about mastering a body of content, memorizing a bunch of facts or whatever. 
Uh, it's about uh, being able to find the information, learning how to use resources, uh, basically how to build your own, uh, roll your own, I guess, uh, educational methods. Uh, the main fo focus is the actual construction process of knowledge facilitated by interaction with the game. Uh, so this, it sounds a little bit far out. I don't know how clear we can really get with this theory. You know, we're constructing things. You know, it certainly is true that you don't, I feel like, that, you know, there's that old saying, you don't really know something until you try to teach it to somebody else. Uh, just because that, you know, when you have to really articulate it, uh, that's when you start to learn. And there you'll find there's a lot of stuff, well, I'm not really too sure about this. You know, I thought I knew it, but, you know, now that I'm trying to articulate it, I find there's some, uh, I'm actually kind of vague on a few things. So it kind of forces you to think more about it. Uh, so that's, you know, why that's effective. So they say you can do something similar to that in a game. Students need to play with the knowledge. Uh, they must actively engage in the video game and construct their own knowledge. So they're basically trying to say, let's, you know, let's take that open world concept and see where that can get us in terms of education. So a couple of examples here. Let's see, this first one is uh, one that a lot of my students have written about the Kerbal Space Program. Let me zoom this forward. So this was a little indie game that just kind of came out of nowhere. Kerbal is, yeah, there's Elon Musk. So I don't know if we're going to actually get to see them building the rockets. It's like it's coming up here in a second. Yeah, so the, it uses, again, actual physics or astrophysics, I guess, in this case. Uh, so that you're building up these rocket ships. You're trying to launch. And supposedly all this is based on, like, simulation, real simulations. So you're not just learning how to play this game. But, you know, if you get really good at this, you basically know how to design <laughs> uh, working uh, rockets and things. So it would be a good introduction, I suppose, to... Uh, a career maybe doing some type of engineering or rocketry or astronomy I suppose explore new planets but you know, that, that's a pretty good example you know it's certainly challenging I've tried to play this and my rockets you know I didn't get very far <laughs> you know I didn't get very far at all then you see like these uh, you know six seven year olds that have gotten into this and you're just like wow Wow, that kid is like the net new Einstein. Uh, so that's really impressive. Uh, and then this other one is Minecraft is one that gets talked about a lot. And of course, you got the regular game Minecraft. Uh, but there's also this, what they call Minecraft Education Edition. And as you can see here, all sorts of teachers using this uh, to teach various things. Uh, let's see if she will uh, show us how she's using it. Mr. NPC. Welcome to Minecraft School. Today we're going to learn how to code with conditionals. So I'm not really sure what I'm looking at here. I guess that's a way to bring in some little page of text. Beware of creepers. Okay. This is actually good. There's some better examples if I could find them where they're you know, they're teaching uh, kids like how to use logic circuits and things to build these, they basically build stuff within Minecraft and to build it you have to know about the the way logic circuits work and have to dig through that and find it but uh, anyway as you can see this, this is a big movement there's Minecraft Hour of Code a lot of it is, yeah here's one about food chains and the science of light simulating trade and industry uh, so people can take this Minecraft game and bring it into the classroom and, you know, teach something, whatever their course is. They can find a way to use Minecraft to teach it. <clears throat> and that's pretty cool because if you play Minecraft, you know, there's a lot of a, a lot of it is about building things and crafting things. Uh, so that's a lot different than just uh, answering a question, doing some questions and then playing a game, coming back doing some more questions. So anyway, that that's a pretty popular movement. Uh, let's see, social cultural component. Uh, in addition to working with the teacher, this approach stresses students collaborating with other students, discussing, reflecting, analyzing. All right, so here's the idea again: is you can't just have the the student uh, just playing the game and expect that to do all the work. You know, let the, 
it's not enough just to play the game. You have to be talking about it, uh, trying to teach it to other people. And that's where these uh, all this community focus comes in. You know, you get the kids together. Uh, they're talking about the stuff they made, showing it to each other. They're on this. There's, I think there's, yeah, the forum here where you can come on, ask questions about, you know, how do I build, you know, teaching in Minecraft. So some of these are teachers, but a lot of these will be students as well, uh, talking to each other. You know, when you do some game design, when you get into something like uh, Unity or Twine for that matter, a lot of the learning will be in these discussion boards and forums, uh, just from other people trying to, you know, do the same thing you are. It's not always just going to a manual, going to a teacher. You know, you could be working with some other game makers to show like, I don't know, how do we do this thing? Uh, so you get together, you discuss it, you reflect, you try out stuff, you find out, okay, we have figured it out. Uh, and this theory is basically saying is that's how all learning works or how that's the most effective way. It's a lot more effective than just always looking to a teacher uh, to tell you everything or, or to memorize some stuff. You know, instead, get in there, see what you can do with this. If you can't figure it out, come back, uh, discuss it, work with some other uh, people, and you'll learn a lot better that way. Uh, so let's see, take a minute to explore Kerbal EDU or Minecraft Education Edition. So I'll put the links there for you. So just check those out. And then see, uh, what do you see there? Is it still just that behaviorist model there? Do you see a little evidence, maybe of some cognitive psychology? Are they talking about the way learning works, mentally speaking? Or maybe there's some of this constructivist mindset, right? You're constructing your own knowledges uh, to make their case for these games' educational potential. Uh, but what I really want you to see, you know, that spent a little bit of time on that, but I think the real crux of this is this. So what evidence... What kind of scientific evidence are they providing there that shows this actually works? And what kind of case are, can they build that they have some foundation upon? Uh, foundation to build this upon. So see what you can find, about 100 words, and again, come back and we'll move on. All right, and here's old James Paul G. I actually got to hear him talk one time. I think they brought him into, I don't know if his computer's in writing or four C's, but their composition conference. But anyway, the guy really gets around. He writes well. He makes things accessible. Uh, they do. I think the authors are right. He kind of just came into this like a lot of educators. Didn't really care about game studies. You know, played a couple of games and thought, well, okay, I know enough now to start writing about it. So that kind of uh, ticks people off that he didn't really spend a lot of time familiarizing himself with game studies. You know, it's a common problem. I think it's ironic these authors keep complaining about that because they, <laughs> you know, in my opinion, they've done the same exact thing. They just kind of ignore what they don't have time for. Uh, but anyway, that's n neither here nor there for this, uh, for our purposes. Uh, so what G says is that, you know, he, he's got this language he's developed from education theory, this idea of the semiotic domain. And semiotics, just another one of these fancy words, just kind of means anything. It could be a word, a picture, just something with meaning, some kind of sign or a symbol. And so he says, video games are kind of like this big collection of signs and symbols. You uh, get it, you play World of Warcraft, you're seeing all this stuff, you don't know what it is at first. Eventually you learn how to navigate it. And then it's uh, it's kind of valuable to be able to do that. You play World of Warcraft for a while, you, get, you learn that domain, and then something about that process translates uh, it's like a little muscle that starts building up. So then when you play another game that could be totally different, you're sort of exercising that again. And the, I guess the idea is the, the more times you do this, the better you get at it. Uh, so that if you went into sci a science class, you could be using that same sort of, okay, let me sort of categorize what it is I'm looking at here. Let me uh, start probing uh, the, the probabilities here. Uh, learning and identity. So this is another key thing. This is where I think G is really onto something. So the games are better at creating agency and identification. Uh, so there's a big difference if you have like that Minecraft game and you say let's you're going to be in the role of a scientist uh, do, or a chemist or whatever doing an experiment. You, you sort of as a kid you're thinking okay I'm sort of in this role I'm playing a scientist and that makes you feel more uh, in control I suppose and more powerful uh, than if you just feel like well I'm just a kid in a classroom with a book. <laughs> I have to memorize this <laughs> for the quiz, right? There's no effort there to identify as a scientist or an expert. Uh, so I think G's kind of on to something. 
you know, especially uh, you know, a lot of kids, they like this feeling of controlling a powerful character. Uh, I mean, I do. It's not just kids. Uh, situating meaning and learning. Uh, so probing the game world. So you, you learn things by just experimenting. You're, you're running around. You're jumping. You're hitting your head on things, whatever. You know, that's how you learn how this world works, the video game world. You don't just sit down with an instruction manual. You know, that, that's how you really know a novice gamer, right? They'll say, where's the instructions? <laughs> like, you don't need no instructions. Just get in and start playing. My God, you'll figure it out. Uh, whereas, you know, the classroom is like, well, it's all about the instructions. Uh, telling and doing. Uh, so you provide the feedback, the sound effect, whatever. Boom. Okay, no, that was wrong. <laughs> okay, that was good. Uh, enhancing the critical aspects. So, you know, again, with this Kerbal Space Program, I'm pretty sure that's not 100% accurate, right? They didn't try to put in, like, everything. Uh, they just put the parts in that they think that are important enough or fun enough or that will uh, scaffold a learning experience. You know, something you could sort of start with, you know, and build up more and more, you know, as you get more comfortable with that. You know, most games will have a, you know, they'll get more difficult, more challenging as you go along, right? It'll just hit you at the very beginning of the game with all of the, uh, the, the abilities and skills. Uh, cultural modes, games content represents ways of perceiving the world and have a bearing on other aspects of life. And so that's kind of what we were talking about before with Bow Ghost, this idea of the procedural rhetoric. You know, you set up a world like Civilization or, you know, any kind of game world, game, Grand Theft Auto or Assassin's Creed, uh, and the way you represent, the way you sort of put that world together is in a way kind of trying to convince people this is the way that it was. Uh, or same thing with this, this, I would say the same thing with TV shows like CSI. I'm kind of saying this is how crime scene investigation works. And uh, you might, of course, your teachers, and <laughs> if you study some forensic science, they'll say, no, it's nothing like that. Uh, nevertheless, that's the idea that people have uh, developed by playing those games. And, you know, I think G is right. You know, you could do you could do that poorly, or you could do it well. You know, and you could. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be ridiculous and wrong. Uh, you know, you could make a game where, like uh, we talked about, America's Army. Uh, yeah, they put some stuff in there, so you can't just point your gun at you know your fellow uh, recruits in that. There's there's some rules and procedures that are actual army procedures that you can learn about uh, from that. So it's not just about teaching you running around shooting things. It's like they're trying to teach you, like, this is the culture of America's army, right? This is what it's like. Uh, let's see, meta studies. Uh, so a meta study just means they go on, they've gone in and looked at a whole bunch of different studies all over the place and just tried to see, like, what? If we put all this together, can we learn anything? Can we draw anything? Uh, that's called a meta study. And there's been a couple of these. The authors mentioned one in 2010. And they basically concluded from that is, again, the idea that, yeah, it seems like you can learn stuff from games. It's not really, tr we can't really see that it's better necessarily than older methods. Uh, again, with a confidence thing. Uh, so you might retain information longer and you might be better able to transfer it to other situations. So that's, you know, that's kind of interesting there. So I guess if you're playing, there's one that I remember called uh, Garage Mechanic. I think is the name of it but it's basically a game where you're fixing cars so the cars come in and then you're like putting you opening it up taking the engine apart putting in a new transmission or whatever and it's uh, actually surprisingly detailed you know and if you play this you feel like well I feel like I know a lot more about cars uh, than I did before I started this game so my confidence is up and so I guess maybe uh, you know, assuming that that is not just uh, made up stuff in that game, which I kind of doubt, maybe I would be able to do something like put in a new transmission. Uh, maybe I'd, maybe I would be able to retain more knowledge, you know, especially if I played that game a lot, uh, than if I was just somebody who had uh, read a textbook on it. You know, I could read that textbook over and over and over and over again, but playing the game is more like the hands-on experience, if you will. You know, maybe that's the way to think about this. Playing a game is more like a hands-on experience than just reading a book. And let's see, what's the other point there? A problem with all such studies is that it's difficult to objectively measure educational 
effectiveness. That's certainly true. We do this. This is a big problem in all of education. Uh, again, we don't have some kind of mind device. You can just put a helmet on your head and like, okay, you're 12% smarter than you were before my class. Uh, <laughs> you know, you can do things. You could, you could do quizzes. You know, there's, you could just ask, do you feel like you've learned more? Uh, but it's just there's no real concrete, objective way to show you've actually learned more. This method is better. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of like even like the IQ tests. You always feel like, oh, my IQ was so and so. Well, they'll say, well, those IQ tests are biased. You know, they're actually uh, uh, flawed in some way. Like all the standardized tests, uh, there's always some kind of problem with those. Uh, so even like the big business people can't figure this out. Like they, they can't come up with anything that everybody's going to agree on. So why are we even bothering, you know? Uh, so here's just kind of a fun question for you. Uh, so do you think it's possible, let's see, does a playful approach ruin the educational experience? Likewise, does any educational factor make a game less fun? So I had the Minecraft example up here. So a lot of you probably like Minecraft. Uh, would you, if I said, play the Minecraft Education Edition instead, just, just automatically, you're like, oh, <laughs> that's not going to be as much fun. Uh, you think there's just something intrinsic, like you just, maybe this is the bad, wrong goal, or right? you just let, edu let education be what it is. It's not supposed to be fun. Uh, you're just supposed to learn this stuff uh, and just get it over with, right? And that's, you know, is that just reality? Uh, or maybe the, there is a way to like blend these things and make it more fun and that will be uh, more effective. You know, a lot of teachers say, well, if you could make it fun, but that's if you, the more fun it is, the less educational it's going to be. Uh, so there's people that feel like that. Anyway, I just want to hear from you as a student. What do you think? All right, so let's uh, move on then. Uh, just a few last things. Uh, the news games, uh, the idea there was you take something in the, in the news and make a game about it. And you, the idea was instead of just reading an article or watching a film or a little video clip, uh, you can actually get in there and maybe do some simulations, uh, you know, just some kind of interactive content, basically. Uh, and that would help you explore that item in the news better than if it was just, a, again, just text or video. Uh, so there's a couple of those. It doesn't really seem to go anywhere because it's too hard. Basically, by the time you get this game made, the, the news cycle's moved on to something else, right? So <laughs> kind of like yesterday's news. Uh, the political games, uh, there's some of these. Again, they, you, you re read about them all the time in these game studies articles, uh, like the tax invaders. Uh, you know, I think I don't know if Obama did it. Uh, the election before that, there were several games uh, these political campaigns would put out. Uh, really just crappy games, but I guess the idea was maybe somehow kids or gamers will want to play these games and vote for the candidate. And I'm not really sure how it was supposed to work. Some of them were kind of funny. You know, you just have like the heads of the candidates there and they would, you could kind of shoot at the heads. <laughs> it's kind of gruesome, I suppose. <laughs> but like that Space Invaders game. Uh, so they sort of took that Space Invaders concept, but they had like the, the aliens were like the heads uh, of the uh, uh, political rivals. And here's one that you hear about every now and then. I don't know if this will do better this year, but every four years they have Stardock comes out with this political machine game. This is the 2021. Of course, there was a 2016. I don't know. Maybe the first one might have gone back to I actually have some copies of the first one of these. Uh, but they, this one tries to be, it's not really about, you know, vote for a certain candidate. It's just trying to simulate the political experience. So I suppose this would be a good example where you could say they're making some arguments in here about the political process and the way the political process works. You know, how do you win this game? Uh, within those rules would be some uh, assumptions that might you know, might you might play this and get even more cynical about the elections, or it could have the opposite effect. So if you look at like spread your ideology, <laughs> generate enthusiasm. Uh, I like this series just because as a rhetorician, this is a this game is about rhetoric. You know, it's about persuading people, and 
it's kind of like those Madden games, except instead of having the names of the uh, athletes, you have the names of the uh, candidates there. Uh, so like I say, I think they try to do a pretty good job of being, you know, not being partisan there. Uh, but anyway, it, it's a pretty fun example of that. <clears throat> All right, and then uh, advertainment. Uh, I think this screenshot kind of says it all. <laughs> uh, you want to sell some mac and cheese. You know, they've always trying to do something. So we got to get people talking about our product somehow. Let's do a game. This is like some kind of weird putt-putt style game. Uh, this candy stand. Uh, this was put out by, a, uh, what's his name, David Crane and maybe Cartwright. I'm blanking on the other guy's name. Uh, but these were basically the founders of Activision. You know, I guess they felt like, we still don't have enough money. Oh, my God, we got to make more money. More millions. Uh, so they went into this candy stand business. So it, it was just, to me, so cheesy. Uh, <laughs> mac and cheese. Uh, they just would they make a pretty good game and then they would charge you like fifty thousand dollars or some huge sum to license it so they would you know put your craft labels on it you know i guess they looks like they've got went to a little bit more effort here to make like that look like a mac <laughs> a macaroni <laughs> uh but that was the idea you know maybe people will come and play this game come to your website and hang out and then you could sell ads combine the message in the gameplay you know, Bogos talks about some that are better than this. Uh, one of the ones he talked about was a uh, one of these car companies, and they were S making these little SUVs, compact SUVs. And uh, the idea was we, we could put a lot in this SUV, put a lot of cargo in there. And so they made a little game, and the game was like, how much stuff can you put into the SUV? You know, it was kind of like a little puzzle game, you know, like dragging all this stuff, and it would fit into the back of this SUV. And so you'd, you'd play that for a while, and I guess the goal was to make you think, wow, I should get this SUV, because look at all this stuff. I really feel like I'm putting a lot of stuff in this car, a lot more than I could get in my, uh, you know, Honda or whatever. Uh, so that's a little better example. But anyway, that's advertainment. Obviously a lot of money in that. I don't know if it mentioned giveaways there. Yeah, so the giveaways would just be like Burger King did, when the, was it the first Xbox? The Xbox 360 came out. They, there was hardly any games for this thing. As the Burger King just made a bunch of Burger King, quick little Burger King games, and they just gave them away. Uh, weren't all that great, but, you know, people went out and got them because they were free. And back then, a game would cost you like 60 bucks. <laughs> that was a pretty good deal. <laughs> uh, but now they're trying to get more integral, like I said, make the game. Not just have like a Burger King uh, billboard somewhere but actually have the game be about that. All right, gamification. So instead of trying to bring game the game, uh, bring the game into the content you're trying to enrich rather than the other way around. Uh, so in schools, we see these, the badge system. I'll show you that in a second. Leaderboard systems, points, uh, the Fitbit. If we click on this for a minute. You know, this is getting into like health games. Uh, so you uh, make games using this. So you, you have the kids out running around or jogging or whatever it is they're doing. And then you can make games. You basically make a game out of that real life activity, right? So maybe if you... Fitbit helps parents and their children understand how physical activity impacts overall well-being and health. So this is a pretty good example of this, right? Because you could imagine... You're trying to teach a kid about physical activity and health by reading a textbook. Okay, that's kind of boring. You know, it's kind of far removed. Uh, if you you know give them uh, this Fitbit, and it's got some I guess some ways to measure their activity, and then you have you combine this like you can see the debriefing. So the parents are talking to their kids about it. They're reflecting on it. You know, this will probably work a whole lot better uh, than just you know, go, go out and run <laughs> or read this book. Uh, so that, they're probably on to something there. Uh, I think there's some other examples that'll make this a little bit uh, clearer. Let me just skip this question for a minute. Uh, so this is the fun piano. Uh, so the, the thing here was the they had this escalator, as you can see, and then the stairs. 
Uh, so they were saying, we want people to take the stairs because you get better exercise uh, than taking the escalator. Uh, so what they did, oh, let me see, there's the video. So I thought this was pretty clever. Let's see, so yeah, they're, they're all taking the escalator, but here somewhere they will, yeah, I think that's showing them like setting up the, the keyboard, but look what happens, yeah, here we go. So now you got like this keyboard. giving them feedback right somebody's gonna have to probably try to play chopsticks on it you know I, that's what I would want to do <laughs> that's a pretty good example right you can see how they're uh, they got a real life goal they want people to get in better shape by taking these stairs uh, so they use kind of a game system they try to make it fun and a lot of these other jobs are like you know it's the same deal like how can we make people turn out more widgets on the assembly line Let's make a game out of it. <laughs> let's have a leaderboard. <laughs> uh, let's, uh, you know, throw see if we could throw in some ideas from games and then make it more fun. Uh, so there's, there's a little video. So again, take a minute to look at this. This is about D2L and this idea of these badges. Uh, so you have to scroll down a little bit here. I think, I think this is the video. So it's, it's a couple minutes long. Uh, so we'll look at this video, you know, it's talking about basically ways to bring in these badges or I, I think of them, them kind of like achievements in video games. And so there's a lot of people excited about this. I think this will make a really big boom, uh, boost to learning, It'll get students a lot more excited about learning if they're earning these badges or certificates. Uh, so take a look at that. And again, just do you think it would work? Do you like the idea? Uh, why or why not? Okay, so just to uh, wrap up here, they talked a little bit here about idealism versus instrumentalism in this debate. Uh, so the instrumentalists, you know, they're, I kind of imagine you go to one of these gamification conferences, right? And you've got a lot of panels that are just about how do you do this? Uh, you know, how do I make a badge system for my class? So they're not really asking like, why would I do this? What evidence is there that this would work or anything like that? It's just like how to do it, the how. Uh, the idealists, though, are the ones asking, like, why? Why would you want to do that? What evidence is there for that? And they're already finding some flaws with gamification. You know, I kind of wonder, are people still taking that piano? You know, maybe that sort of thing was fun at first, but, you know, now that it's been years, maybe it's not so much fun. Uh, they also talked, I think, quite reasonably that uh, the extrinsic rewards demotivate in the long term. Uh, so you see this in the world of uh, sports. You know, as soon as somebody becomes a professional at something, a lot of the fun goes out of it. And it just gets, it gets to basically, it's a job at that point, right? You're, so you're doing this for a living. Uh, that's a much different experience than just doing it for fun. Uh, you know, I, I haven't played any professional sports, believe it or not. But I know when you go to an intramural game or you just, there's some people playing volleyball, you go play with them. It's a lot of fun, right? Just to play volleyball. Uh, I don't know how I would feel if I was doing that for a living, you know, if I was on a team. You know, and the same thing with learning. You know, uh, in schools, you hear te teachers talk, complain sometimes about grade grubbers. And it's basically the, the students in the class, like no matter how creative you try to be with your assignments, there's always that, you know, son of a gun who's just like, how many points is this? And, you know, I, how many pages does it have to be? You know, and I want to make an A in your course. Uh, it's like the only important thing to them is getting a grade, not actually learning the content. You know, there it's the it's all about the GPA for them, just like uh, for that athlete. It's all about the paycheck. Right? It's not about uh, having fun in the class, uh, not about learning the material for its own sake. It just gets to be about that reward only. Uh, you know, so maybe I think that's probably true. Uh, also, the again that idea of just being manipulative. You know, if you manipulate somebody you, with this, these sort of tactics, it can almost seem like a totalitarian. Uh, Orwellian type uh, situation. Uh, here's the games for change. I'm pretty sure I've showed you this already, so we won't. I don't want to recap it again or go over it again. You certainly can take a look at this. Now, I tell students, you know, if you do want to get into game design, 
as a living. If you want to make some money, this is just low hanging fruit. <laughs> I mean, there's all of these organizations that are basically just, please make a game with some type of social justice theme. Uh, or, let's see, a learning theme, I suppose. What are these? What remains of Edith Finch? Uh, a tree, tree. Tree transforms you into majestical rainforest tree. Uh, so basically what I'm saying is there's a lot of grant money out there. And a lot of these games aren't really all that impressive at all, really, from a game development perspective you know I could probably sit down uh, well I don't know about me personally but you know you could probably sit down if you had a small little team somebody that knew unity uh, somebody that could even probably even do some of this with like game maker uh, but you can make one of these games apply for these awards and get you know some pretty serious money you know somewhere here they have the uh, yeah, here's the student challenge so there were some students from, I forget the university, they did one called Darfur is Dying. And they got basically international fame for that little game. There's hardly anything to the game. It's some, it's simplistic. Uh, but just having that powerful theme and winning this award, I mean, they they got a lot of, let's see, submissions are now open. Let's see, invite students to make video games about real world, real world issues and community impact themes. Oh, I'm just trying to see where you can, uh, what you could win. <laughs> uh, I might have to dig around in this a little bit, but anyway, it's it's pretty serious money. And my God, this would if you won, even if you won like third or fourth place, or even just the fact that you submitted something to this and put that on your resume, uh, I think would go a long ways uh, towards getting you a job. You know, needless to say, if you won a won a prize, you're you know, you'd probably even have people contacting you, uh, offering you jobs, uh, just because it is, you know, that's, that's what people want to see. Okay, anyway, continued challenge. Uh, so I guess this is our final thought here. <laughs> so there, there's a lot of cynicism about this, and they, I think, quite rightfully point out, few teachers will accept that killing monsters can be educational. And in the eyes of many non-gamers, uh, killing monsters is what games are all about. So I run into this all the time. You know, there's a talk here at St. Cloud State about an esports team, you know, and I start talking about esports and the eyes start rolling and they're like, that's not a sport. That's just, you know, some uh, kid sitting on a couch with a bag of popcorn and a game pad or whatever. So it's just this real stereotypical stuff. Uh, you know, and the same thing with like education. They're like, well, this, The Witcher has nothing to do with learning algebra or <laughs> whatever. You know, fine. But, you know, there's a lot more, as we've seen in this lecture. Uh, for one, there's, there's a whole serious games movement. It's not just what's popular, what's on the shelf, what, you, what you're hearing about. Uh, it's not Pac-Man, for God's sake. Uh, but anyway, this, this is still the prevailing uh, attitude and I think it's probably up to us in classes like this to try, start trying to enlighten people. There's more to it. <laughs> There's more you can do. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, thanks for watching this. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please do ask a question, make a comment. Uh, you know, let me know how you're feeling, and I'll see you next time.